thing about it. I don't know which. Uh, there are lots of possibilities and scenarios. There's excellent information, very solid information and, and intelligence that the Chinese Army, the PLA, People's Liberation Army, has pre-positioned uh, a lot of equipment and supplies and some men down in Mexico as well as some in Canada. Uh, the Russians the same way. In fact, a friend of mine was at a Russian military base in Mexico, and he told me about visiting there. Uh, the, when these earth changes kick in, gentlemen, China's going to lose a substantial part of its agricultural real estate. It's going to be underwater. And they're going to have a lot of hungry mouths to feed. Despite all the fatalities, they're still going to have a lot of hungry mouths. And what's unique about this country that, that's wanted by China is the real estate between the Appalachian Mountains and the Rock Mountains, the most productive agricultural real estate on the planet. And that's the prize. The rest of us, in terms of people and uh, infrastructure and so forth, they could give a hoot. But the breadbasket where we grow these grains and cattle and all the rest of it, that's what the Chinese are going to be looking to capture and take for themselves. I find that. Uh, Go ahead, Griff. How probable do you think the Jericho scenario is for us here in the United States? Um, I don't know. I want to assign a, a percentage to it, Griff. What is uh, your opinion? Just your it's, it's, on, it's, it's on the table. Here. here Here's how I've I've discussed this before. Here's how I'll answer your question, Griff. If one nuclear weapon goes off in one American city, it'll change this country for a long time. If two go off in two cities, it'll change this country forever. Um, if one went off once a week for several weeks, this country would be brought to its knees and and uh, just absolutely um, in turmoil, in absolute turmoil and chaos, and and ready for a strong foreign power to do with do with us as they will, which obviously means Russia or China or both. Between a combination of Russian technology and Chinese manpower, it's a very formidable force. You and I both know that the devices have been in place in American cities for some time now, and it is well, probable that at some point in the future they may be detonated. The, uh, the stories I've got about those devices, Griff, come from well-placed sources that I trust and rely on. And uh, as far as I know, they're there. Yes, and, and I, I confirm that with my information also. Uh, the, the people that are in the, um, and you know the recent uh, Justice Department booklet has defined us as terrorists by being constitutionalists and survivalists. Right. We're now terrorists. Uh, right, the right. terrorists, the survivalist and constitutionalist people that I've talked to, uh, feel the probability of the uh, Jericho scenario is is up in the 85, 90 percent bracket. Probably. Well, like I said, I, I wouldn't want to assign a percentage to it myself, but I, I, on one hand, on the other, I can't disagree with it. Uh, it it's, I can't do that. I've got a printout here of that of Kurt Nemo's article about what you're talking about, the Justice Department hit list, Master Patriot hit list. i got that right here in front of me. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the Jericho scenario would be, uh, even that would not be a worst-case scenario compared to 200-mile-an-hour uh, winds and uh, ocean waves at several hundred feet high. Uh, as, as bad as nuclear devices going off in American cities would be, uh, 200 mile an hour winds and ocean waves uh, several hundred feet high would be even worse. Well, we're certainly looking at the probability of all of these events and more. Well, we are. And, and here's another uh, piece of the pie here, Griff. Uh, once these events kick in, much of this high-tech stuff either won't work at all or, or would be useless. Uh, because of coronal mass ejections, uh, putting out an electromagnetic pulse type energy that would cook modern electronics. Uh, point being, with a lot of these high tech weapons, it might be a matter of use them or lose them. And that's a fairly short time frame, I would say two years or less, that they have to make use of these 
high-tech weapons before they'll be useless. John, uh, now, uh, John King lives in uh, Pennsylvania, and I know that um, one of the scenarios being talked with, about with Planet X is uh, entering into uh, another ice age, much like uh, that movie, um, The Day After Tomorrow, where right. you saw the majority of the United States um, um, being covered by ice. Uh, do you see a perpetual winter scenario taking place? I see it as a possibility. I see it as a possibility. Now, now what happened in the film took, took place in a matter of hours. Right. Uh, we, if we're looking at an ice age, it would not necessarily take place in a matter of hours. It, it may be more a matter of years, we hope. Uh, the more time we have to prepare, the better off we are. Uh, you, you can live and survive in Arctic conditions, of course. People have been doing it for many centuries. But you have to have infrastructure to support you. That's a problem with England, Ireland, Scotland, and other areas uh, that are, have been kept warm by the Gulf Stream, is that the infrastructure won't support human life once it gets to the kind of winters they have in Moscow. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the pi I doubt that the freshwater pipes in London are buried more than 18 to 24 inches deep at the most. The freshwater pipes in Moscow are probably 7 to 8 feet deep to deal with those kinds of winters. Right. There's Nothing in the human-built infrastructure in the United Kingdom is built to deal with these kinds of winters, which means tens of millions of people would have to go and live someplace else because the infrastructure they've got won't support human life. Right. Or North Carolina, might I add. We had a um, relatively cold winter uh, this last winter, and uh, you know you hear the news reports of how many people, how many houses, their, their pipes bursting because right. they freeze. Because houses down here aren't as, uh, or let's just say the pipes aren't insulated like uh, they normally would be up north because we don't normally experience zero-degree right. temperatures. As a matter of fact, uh, until last winter, I've never experienced uh, uh, you know, a nighttime temperature getting down to zero or into single digits. And, right. and, and we did just that, and that was the first time I've ever experienced it down here. Right. Well, I lived at Fort Bragg for a year and a half back in 68, 69, and into, into 70. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a, a little bit of snow, a little bit of cold weather, but it was really no big deal. Right. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the engineers I work with, he played a, an interesting story. He, he played a gag on his kids one day. He pulled up the drawings for a snowmaking machine, and it's very simple to make. You know, you have a garden hose, you make a nozzle, it... it uh, uh, not ionizes the water, but it at least makes it the, so small, fine mist, that when it shoots it up in the air, if it's cold enough and it needs to be about 27, 28 degrees, right. um, that it'll make snow. And right. so he did that using, you know, his his, low, his, his uh, air compressor, his hose, and he had this nozzle. And it took him probably, once he built it, he had to wait about three months for one day, one day, of 27 degree <laughs> weather just to play the gag on his kids and it ended up being on a Saturday and he wanted to do it on a school day to make them think they had a snow day. Oh, so it, 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 that didn't even work out because we don't normally get temperatures that low. Well, and that's the that's the point I was trying to make is that that it's it's very interesting and then Griff can attest to this cuz he lives about an hour hour and a half away from me. Uh it was probably the hottest summer that I can ever remember being down here, especially um, the amount of 100-degree days consecutively right. was absolutely unbelievable. And I mean, do Same you, thing here. How do, you, thing. how do you attribute that? What do, you, do you attribute that to the, the, uh, the Atlantic well, conveyor stopping? Is well, that first, of all, first of all, I am not a scientist. I'm a homicide detective. Right. But I'll tell you who the scientist is, and if you'll agree to come on your show as a guest, you'd, you'd be wonderful. Dr. Professor James Mechanic. Professor McCanny has written uh, several books, one and specifically on weather-related events, and his understanding of weather far exceeds most climatologists. But the weather is truly going bonkers. You know, we had the same thing here in terms of heat this past summer here, uh, as I say, deep in the mountains of Missouri Ozarks. More, more, more hot days uh, with uh, with high temperatures between 95 and 100, and actual temperatures, and felt temperatures of 105-plus than we've ever had since they've been keeping records. 
Of course, mm-hmm. Moscow had the Moscow had the hottest summer in a thousand years. You know, uh, and the, not that their records are all that great going back a thousand years ago, but they they had some kind of records, obviously. Right. Um, weather is a consequence of energy from our sun. Uh, our sun is what controls our weather, and our sun has been doing very strange things for a number of years. Uh, weather has become become very crazy. We on May the 8th, 2009 here, deep in the mountains of Missouri Ozarks where I live, we had a hurricane. Now, according to traditional meteorology, you can't have a hurricane over dry land hundreds and hundreds of miles from any ocean. But we did. We had eight inches of rain in one hour. My classic turbo diesel Mercedes got swept up in, by my little creek that hasn't flooded in 80 years and washed down about 200 feet before it stopped against the tree. Uh, <laughs> and we had we had a, a, my neighbor lady was trapped in her house with her daughter for a couple of hours and and it was just a mess. Uh, the state of Missouri lost the equivalent of one third annual timber harvest on the ground during that three or four hour period of time when that storm swept across the state. Um, but that can't happen, according to traditional meteorology. That can't happen. A hurricane over dry land, but it did. And uh, in fact, an earlier hurricane over Oklahoma. I've got the radar image on my DVD there, uh, Joe, that you saw. Mm-hmm. That's right. Now, here's an interesting point on this particular topic. A friend of mine, uh, she's gone public, Ann Morrison. She's a engineer, has two different engineering degrees. She was at a class uh, given by the St. Louis County government uh, five years ago, just after Hurricane Katrina. And this was training for Skywarn. It's a nationwide program where civilians are trained to accurately and correctly observe weather and report back to their county sheriff's department what they're seeing. So she's in the Skywarn class, and the instructor is a uh, young climatologist, meteorologist from NOAA uh, in his early 30s. So they're, they're taking this class, and there's a break, and they're out in the hallway talking and getting a drink of water. And the climatologist makes the following statement. Just wait until you start seeing these hurricanes farming over dry land. Now, Hurricane Katrina had just been five or six weeks earlier. So hurricanes were a big topic. My friend Ann attempted to ask a follow-up question, and the young meteorologist figured out real quick that if he answered it, his career and his pension would be toast. So he didn't answer the question. Now, that was before that hurricane that you saw on my DVD there over Oklahoma, Joe. Mm Mm-hmm. They knew then. They knew in 2005 that we would soon be hitting hurricanes over dry land. It was no surprise to the, to the scientists studying these things. And now we are. It's become almost a routine matter to have hurricanes over dry land. John, go ahead with your question. Uh, thank you. Um, what about inland tsunamis? I just recently watched a movie called 2012. They were talking about... Uh, uh, crustal shift and liquefaction of the of the continents, and uh, they showed uh, very graphic detail of tsunamis uh, a thousand foot tall. That might be a little bit of uh, Hollywood, but uh, do you know or have you been told of uh, any uh, inland tsunamis coming in as far as the Ohio Valley? I mean, I live just north of Pittsburgh. Should I be concerned? Well, okay, I'll, I'll tell you what the Navy says. I'll tell you what the historical record is and then maybe we can get to some speculation. The Navy says, the U.S. Navy, not John Moore, the U.S. Navy says all coastal areas are at risk 400 feet above sea level and lower. The U.S. Navy says the uh, Mississippi River will become 100 to 200 miles wide, 100 to 200 feet deep, and that the Great Lakes will merge together to be one Great Lake, extending all the way up to Hudson Bay, creating a new inland sea. Now, that's what the Navy says. Right. The, histor- the historical and, and uh, record, not historical because that's man-made history, uh, the record left behind uh, by these events in the past is pretty easy to observe. For example, you can go to the tops of these big flat rocks in Arizona called mesas, and you can find seashells. You can go to Texas. Most parts of Texas within 100 miles of the ocean, of the Gulf of Mexico, and I was down there just about two months ago, sea shells just lying about. In fact, most of the ground is sand, not dirt. Up in your area, 
uh, up there, John. Uh, 